Everybody, can everybody hear me? All right, awesome. Good, good, good. All right, before before we get started, I actually want to say a quick prayer and I'd like y'all to join me. Um, it has been a rough week for um, for your VR church leadership team. Um, uh, there was a lot that kind of went on behind the scenes to make sure that we could uh, even have this uh, service today. Uh, I'm the backup for the backup. <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, and then I even had some crazy stuff happen at the last minute that that I almost couldn't make it to. So um, I just want to lift up, um, especially our leadership team in prayer, but all of uh, VR uh, and MMO Church. And make sure you reach out to, to your leaders, especially Pastor DJ, Pastor Alina, uh, Pastor Coco has had a lot of extra responsibility this week. Um, just make sure that you, you send them some uh, some messages of encouragement. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we come before you right now. We thank you so much that we get this time together today, that despite uh, all of the, the crazy things that have happened this week, God, that, that you still made the way for us to be here together and to look at your word together um, as, as this church body. Father, we thank you so much um, for allowing that to happen. I ask that you um, that you bless Pastor DJ, Pastor Lena, Pastor Coco, Pastor Bismuth, God, the whole leadership team, especially give them um, some some extra uh, strength. Some, God, your word says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So God, give them some extra joy uh, this week in the midst of all of the chaos, uh, God, and really for this whole church body, God, I just I thank you so much. I thank you that you allowed each and every one of us to be here and to look at your word together today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've been going through uh, the book of Matthew, uh, and we are on Matthew chapter 18, and uh, pretty much all the books in Matthew, or all the chapters in Matthew, rather, are pretty long, uh, and so I want to be respectful of time, so we'll go ahead and just get right into it. Matthew is, uh, if you're if you're new with us, Matthew is one of the Gospels, which means it's one of the books in the New Testament that uh, really is t tells the story of Jesus's time here on Earth. And so here Jesus is um, talking to his disciples about um, some pretty important things, and uh, there's a lot to get through. If anybody would like to help us read, I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, room participation. So you can go ahead and use the uh, raise hand emoji if you would like to help us read, and I will uh, call on you. Let's see. Let's start with Ben. Ben, if you will help us uh, get through verses 1 through 6 here. So that's this whole section we'll walk through together as you're reading. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <clears throat> He called a child, had him stand among them, and said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn around and become like a little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a child like this is in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the open sea. All right. So right off the bat, Jesus is saying some things that would have probably been um, sort of controversial to hear, which is not new, right? Because it seems like pretty much everything Jesus says would have been pretty controversial, especially to the religious leadership at the time. But when the disciples say, <clears throat> who's the greatest, and Jesus points to the children, uh, in, in this culture at this time, children would have been expected to sit and to listen and to learn, and that they're going to be told what it is that they need to do because they don't know, they don't know what to do. And so the from a child's perspective, what Jesus is calling us to do here, this humility is to be like children, to admit maybe sometimes that we don't that we don't know all of the answers, right? We're going to kind of go on this journey, and that we're going to be constant learners. Uh, this is this is how I interpret this, right? 
And I think he's really speaking against the religious leadership who we have seen Jesus again and again encounter this sort of arrogant religion that presumes that it has all the answers, that it knows everything. And if you just follow all of these rules and all of these laws, that that's, that's the only way to be pure and holy, right? And what Jesus is saying is you need to not act like that. You need to not act like you have all the answers and you need to recognize that you are like a child. Right? And that's not in a pejorative sense. Um, Jesus is saying, you know, to have that curiosity, to recognize that you don't have all of the answers, to to be one who wants to to learn and 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 push forward. And uh, you know, children uh I was thinking of this the other day, like my own kids, kids are just like their default state. Most of the time, it's just, they're happy. I don't know if any of you are around kids a lot. I mean, certainly there are times that kids are sad. They get their feelings broken. Kids feel big feelings. Um, but it really seems to me that like the default state for, for kids is just to be happy and goofy and, and be fun and be content where they are. And, uh, I don't know. Being a parent gives you kind of an interesting perspective on these things. But when Jesus is saying that the greatest of these is the children, he's he's really giving a signal to this uh, religious leadership that thinks that they're the bosses and that they have everything together. Right. He's really speaking to them and saying what you need to be is like this child and recognize that there's so much more uh, to me and so much more to um to my father and to this way of life that you don't actually understand. Right. And then he gives a warning to leaders. Um, right. And th this is one of several warnings in scripture specifically to leaders where Jesus makes it clear that these leaders are held to a higher standard. And he says, if anyone causes one of these little ones who will believe in me to sin, right. If anyone, if anyone causes one of these children, these, 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 uh, naturally curious they want to learn more about me in the way and then you if you lead them in the wrong direction it would be better to have a huge millstone hung around your neck and be drowned in the sea uh, not pulling any punches here right woe to the world because of stumbling blocks it's necessary that stumbling blocks come that's very interesting that jesus says that right a lot of times especially with sort of the modern day arrogant religion right You'll hear things like, well, come to Jesus and you'll be prosperous. Come to Jesus and you won't have any struggles in your life. All you need to do is have enough faith and, and all, of, all of your stumbling blocks will sort of disappear, right? I've, I've heard that taught before, but what Jesus says here, he says, it's necessary that stumbling blocks come, which I think is interesting. He says, but woe to the person through, through whom they come. Um, and so I think it's interesting that Jesus acknowledges that sometimes struggle and uh, pain are necessary. I'm not saying Jesus causes these things, by the way. And he specifically cautions people who do cause these things, right? But I, I find it interesting that that Jesus says here and, and uh, seems to recognize that that process, that refining process, there's some pain that's involved in that, but it's a necessary thing. But woe to the person causes those things for you i just think that that's that's an interesting perspective so all right let's follow through this gateway here <clears throat> all right and let's have um meta mikey meta mikey if you will have help us read if you'll go from verses um eight to 14. Actually, let's do 8 to 10 for right now. All righty. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or have two feet and to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fiery hell. See that you do not disdain one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Yeah, so let's talk about this for a moment. Uh, when Scripture talks about in these passages here, when it says thrown into the eternal fire and thrown into fiery hell, uh, the actual uh, uh, Greek in this instance is referring to uh, Gehenna, which became a symbol for the Jewish people of sort of eternal punishment but the real etymology of this would be is essentially like where the refuse of the city goes and is burned 
and uh, all the refuse, the trash is burned away, and then anything that is remaining that is useful can be sort of recycled. So um, some folks view these verses as uh, a literal um, you know, hell where you will be punished for all of eternity, and there's a lot of folks in uh, Christianity believe that. But uh, also another, uh, I believe, equally valid way to interpret these is uh, be like being thrown into a refiner's fire, right? Like if you've seen folks the way that uh, if you've seen videos and stuff online uh, on how like gold or precious metals and things are refined, and there is this process that involves right this this fire, uh, but what comes out on the other end is a pure and precious thing. Uh, and so it, regardless, it does seem like Jesus is making it very clear that things will be much easier for you, right? If you find yourself sinning, if you remove the cause of your sin, and he and he doesn't pull any punches here, right? Like he's, he's, re he's really, really upfront about this. Um, but I, what I, I kind of like about this is we have a tendency, I think, to say, um, oh, well, just the, the devil's really coming after me. The devil's really tempting me, and I got all this stuff going on. Or uh, a lot of times we want to blame kind of external circumstances in our life for, for when things are, are going wrong or for when we make certain decisions that we know are not the right decisions. And I think Jesus here does, uh, makes it really clear about the personal responsibility that we have, right? Um, he's making it very clear that like, no, this is, this is your problem to solve. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If you've got, you know, quote unquote, external <laughs> circumstances that are causing you to sin, then you figure out how to get rid of those. Um, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Right. He's saying that that sort of pain, that it would be better for you to go through that sort of a pain than to go through, um, this process, whether, um, whether your interpretation of that is a literal fiery hell, or even if it is that refiner's process, that refining process where something comes out on the other end that is, that is more, that is more pure, right? Um, either way, it would be better for you to stop this at the beginning before it gets to that point. See that you did not disdain one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven. What do you think if someone owns a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray? Will he not leave the 99 on the mountains and look for the one that went astray? <clears throat> I think this verse is interesting. Um, I had a friend growing up who, one of her reasons for um, denying Christ actually was because of this verse. Because she said, basically, what kind of a parent <laughs> you know, would <clears throat> abandon all of their other children to look after the one, just to chase after the one that wants to leave? And I actually, at the time, I kind of thought that, that that argument made sense when I was in high school. Not that I agreed, but I could understand why she had that perspective. You know, like, how could, how could uh, a, a, a parent abandon everyone in their family to just to kind of go after the, the one? Uh, but now that I'm a parent now, like, I get it, right? I don't know if that makes sense. Like, if one of my children went missing, I would, in a heartbeat, you know, find, find a babysitter or something for the one that's still there, right? Because I know that they're safe. Do everything that I could to find my lost child, right? Like, I, I, I understand more what this kind of love means now. And you know, God is uh, omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? And so these 99... <laughs> Right, I don't see this as the 99 being abandoned, like my friend viewed that. Right, um, the thing that's important here really is that he will do everything to go after the one, um, because that's how much he loves us. Right? Like, it's I don't want the profoundness of that to be lost on any one of you, right? That God will do everything in his power to chase after you. Uh, and I just think that that's really incredible and it's really amazing. And it's also something, too, that you'll see repeatedly whenever Jesus references this Gehenna, this eternal fire or in this fiery hell. Uh, we've seen this happen several times in Matthew. So you can go back and, and check me if you don't believe it, right? Um, but whenever he references this, he immediately 
says something like this after, right? He'll reference Gehenna and then he'll talk about if the flowers of the fields are, are uh, you know, important enough, then certainly you are, you know, God knows how many hairs are on your head, you know? And so it's really interesting that he'll reference this and then immediately follow it up with how much he loves you and how far he will go out of his way for you. And so for me personally, um, that lens, that, that helps put, uh, gives me a lens on how to uh, interpret some of the other things that he's saying, which I think is, is food for thought. But don't, this is, this is very controversial theology, and so I'm not going to get super deep into it. I'm going to encourage you all to go and do some research and find where you stand on those, those pieces. Um, but I think Jesus makes a really big point whenever he talks about the fires of, of hell he makes a huge point to follow that up immediately with how much God loves us. And I just think there's something really um, beautiful and interesting about that pattern. All right. <clears throat> and if he finds it, he finds that last, that lost sheep, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice more over it than over the 99 that did not go astray. And in the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that one of these little ones be lost. Right. So he says when he finds it, he's going to party more that he got that one back than he did that the 99 didn't stay. Again, that still makes sense to me. It's not that I love, my, you know, if one of my children ran away, it's not that I love the one that didn't run away any less, but I'm going to be infinitely more thankful that, that I recovered the one, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense to some of you that maybe aren't parents. Um, I also love that he follows this up. And this is the thing that I wish I had seen when I had talked with my friend back when I was in you know, high school. And she pointed this out to me in the same way. Your father is not willing that one of them be lost. Right. He's saying very clearly, like, that's not the plan. The plan is not for that one sheep to even get lost in the first place. Um, you know, but if that sheep chooses to wander off, right, because there's this element of free will. Um, this is the process that they will go through to, to chase you. And uh, again, I just think that's really wonderful. All right, let's follow back up here through this other gate. It's actually really funny. I was thinking earlier today, I don't know if you, if any of you are Stargate fans, a big Stargate fan. And I was thinking oh. how, how much, how badly I wanted a Stargate video game. And then I just think it's fun because this, uh, this build has like some, I'm going to call them Stargates from now on. If there's, if you see any more of them. <clears throat> All right, and here we see some uh, some some teaching, some instruction from Jesus on how to handle uh, some conflict. How to handle conflict with a brother, and so there's a couple interesting things that we'll talk about here. First off, let's see who's who's on my list to help read. Dad, hello, can you help us read verses 15 to 17, please? Six, 15 to 17. Yeah. Yep, 15 to 17. This block right here. All right. And then we'll look at this block separately because it's a different translation. If your brother and go and show him his fault, when the two of you are alone, if he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he does not listen, Take one or two others with you that at the testimony of two or three witness, every matter may be established. If he refused to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refused to listen to the church, to him like gentle or tax collector. Yeah. So what we see here is, and this is interesting. Here's the, um, this is uh, the same verses from a paraphrase translation called the message. Uh, and so just so everyone knows when you're talking about a paraphrase translation, it's not a direct translation from the original language. Uh, it's someone who took a direct translation and then just tried to put it in easier to read um, text. And sometimes you can introduce um, some problems with that. So it's always good to also look at direct translations, but sometimes they can also help you get some interesting perspectives on the scripture. So this is from the message. Uh, and by the way, the when, when I'm teaching generally, uh, Pastor Alina is super awesome because my favorite translation is the um, NET translation, N-E-T. Um, 
and uh, you can go to netbible.org and you can learn about that translation and you'll learn about a little bit more about why it's my favorite. Uh, but Pastor Lena always changes this to NET for me, so I super appreciate her. <laughs> so, so shout out to Pastor Lena for, for changing that for me. Um, but then this here, again, this is the message translation. So it says, if a fellow believer hurts you, now that's kind of interesting because over here it just says if your brother sins, right? Um, so up and up here, it says a fellow believer hurts you. Why is that? Why is that there that difference? Uh, well, in the original manuscripts, uh, where it here it says here, if your brother sins, in some of the original manuscripts, it says against you. So if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. But in other of our earliest manuscripts, it doesn't say that. So it's very interesting if you're looking at different translations of the Bible. Sometimes it'll say if your brother sins, and sometimes it'll say if your brother sins against you. Um, but, but both are, are supported in some older uh, manuscripts. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along so the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. Now, the reason that it says the testimony of two or three witnesses, um, we've talked before, if you've been around for a while, about uh, in the kind of original Jewish law and the Jewish legal system, uh, essentially, um, you need a two or three witnesses to establish truth without like hard actual evidence. So you needed two or three witnesses to say that something happened for it to be considered fact in like a Jewish Jewish court, um, which is sort of an interesting historical tidbit. That's why a lot of times in scripture when it talks about witnesses, it says there's two witnesses or th specifically it's usually three witnesses. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. But in this example, if you bring two witnesses, you would be the third witness. So that's why it says two or three. Anyway, sorry. I just think that I think some of those historical tidbits are really interesting sometimes. It says take the witnesses. Uh, and try again. If they still won't listen, tell the church. If he still won't listen to the church, you'll have to start from scratch. Now, the reason that this is here, and I actually, uh, Pastor Coco requested that this be added for when she taught in alt space earlier today. And I think it's very interesting. She has a really interesting point where it says here, treat him like a Gentile or tax collector. That can seem to mean uh, excommunicate them. Like they're, they're no longer in the church. Kick them out of your life, right? Uh, that's not what it means, right? What it says is you have to start over from scratch, confront him for the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. What it essentially means when it says treat him like a Gentile or tax collector is this is the way, verses 15 to halfway through 17, this is the way that you deal with a Christian brother who you have a conflict with. Right? And then at the end of the verse, it's saying, okay, at this point, you have exhausted your options for how you deal with this person as a Christian brother. And so now you deal with them in the same way that you would treat someone who is, well, okay, not a Christian brother because Christianity didn't exist yet, right? <laughs> Technically speaking, right? But as a, 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 a brother in, uh, you know, in Christ, as a fellow or follower of Christ at this point. Um, but at, the, at this point, you treat them as if they're outside of that system and then you have to look at other, other remedies, if that makes sense. Like you've, you've kind of lost not willing to work with you in that sense of like brotherly love and so you have to take other alternatives what it doesn't mean is turn your back on them excommunicate them never speak to them again cut them out of your life that's not what jesus is saying to do here um if you if you feel that you have been wronged or if a brother is being sinful right uh he, he's as he's actually saying well now there's just a different process um and you need to, to do whatever the other process might be I'm going to come down here to the other Stargate. There's another one. I'm going to call them Stargates now. <clears throat> I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. You release on earth will have been released in heaven. And we've seen Jesus echo this sentiment before uh, when he starts talking about sort of the, the power that we have. And he, he's talked about the power of life and death being in our, in our tongue and um, the, the things that we speak have power, the things that we do have power. And basically what he is saying is uh, that uh, he's talking about sort of this supernatural influence that we have. He says, I tell you the truth, if two of you on earth agree about whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. All right, so here we have again kind of the two, there needs to be two, these two witnesses. Now, what does this mean? If two of you on earth agree that you need a first, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Um, what this means, right? And, and we'll get 
there's a verse 20 as well where these two or three are assembled in my name i am there um <laughs> what he's saying here is not whatever your selfish earthly desire that you agree about my father in, in heaven will do for you right but as followers of christ right? as followers of god uh, eventually the goal is to become more and more like him right and eventually our will will begin to align more and more with his will right and so what this is talking about is not like your whatever your earthly desires are the father in heaven will will do that for you though i will say sometimes that happens right um sometimes my kids say papa can we have candy for breakfast and i will tell you that 99 nine percent of the time that's a big old no from me <laughs> right as their as their parent because that is not what is best for them right but i will also tell you that you know 0.01 percent of the time my answer might be you know what today sure <laughs> you know like right so so sometimes sometimes god will give us the things that we ask for but when I look at this as a promise, I, I really view this more as as we become more like him and our will begins to reflect his will and our wills are in alignment that when we ask for those things that are within his will, that he will do those for us. And this verse here is, uh, this verse is super important to VR and MMO church. For where two or three are assembled in my name, I am there among them, Right? What does it mean to be assembled? I, like I think, uh, I think here in VR and MMO Church, we have sort of redefined this in a lot of ways. Um, and I know, you know, for me, you know, when I first stumbled into to VR Church, I was like, "What's going on here? This place is weird. This is like not in a bad way." You know, I was like, "This is kind of cool. This is kind of neat." And I started thinking and challenging my own theology about what it meant to be, you know, part of a church. And it's interesting because, you know, I've talked to other people that uh, really kind of get down on the idea of virtual churches, especially pre-COVID, right? I, so I think it's a lot more um, socially acceptable now. Oh, no. You guys there? My headset. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Okay, good. Wow, my headset blacked out and I got real scared for a minute because I told you there's already been a lot, enough challenges today. Okay, I think pre-COVID, it was a lot more acceptable or a lot less acceptable to have sort of these virtual churches. Um, but this verse, you know, I have seen this in the metaverse. And it was really one of those things that I had to really see and experience it to understand that this applies to the metaverse too. And there are certainly people that would disagree with me and that's fine. They can disagree with me because I've seen this, right? I have seen in my time uh, here at VR and MMO Church coming together uh, as believers and praying for things and feeling the Holy Spirit and knowing God was in it, right? Like just knowing that he was here. And so this verse is, um, you know, a, a little more special to me even than it used to be um, because of what I've learned since I started um, being a part of VR and MMO Church. I just think it, that, that it's awesome that uh, in my experience, my direct experience that this applies to the metaverse too. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's nothing, um, there's nothing magical, <laughs> so to speak, nothing magical about like physical proximity. Um, Cause space doesn't apply to God anyway. Right. He's, he's omnipresent. He is everywhere. Um, and uh, I just, I just think it's cool that in my direct experience, I've seen that. So, all right, through the Stargate. <clears throat> All right, and now I think this is a very interesting verse, and we're going to talk a little bit about this passage after we go through, uh, and let's see, we've got, I know my host panel's not working after my, okay, the Lady S, I see your, I see your hand raises there. Uh, if you can read for us, please, verses uh, 21 to 23. We'll set the stage for this parable Jesus is about to tell. 
Okay. Verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, I tell you, but seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. Oh, what? Well, thank you for reading for us. Uh, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> She'll be back in a minute. Okay. Um, all right, so... Peter says, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? As many as seven times? Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times. So, of course, what this means is we should all get a ledger for everyone that we know, right? And every time we forgive them, we put a little check checkbox in the ledger. And uh, after they have wronged us 77 times on that 78th time, we don't have to forgive them anymore, right? Right? No, obviously not. Obviously not, <laughs> right? Uh, and so for G Jesus, Jesus is, uh, says this for hyperbole. Jesus has a little bit of hyperbole here. He says, not seven, but 77 times. And where is this hyperbole coming from? Uh, well, uh, he says, well, let me tell you a little story to tell you why I said 77 times. And so we're going to see uh, in this translation, uh, it calls the king, just so you all know, it calls the king Lord. Moving forward here. So when you see the word Lord, it's not referring to like God, Lord. It's referring to the the um, hypothetical king in this parable. Okay. So let's come in here and start at verse 24. Oh, I love this build. Like this is exactly what's in my imagination when I think about this passage. Thank you so much uh, to our awesome build team for doing this for us. Okay. Let's have uh, wandering. Um, if you can read verses 24 to 27 for us, please. Okay. Starting over here to our left, going to verse 27. Okay. As he began settling his accounts, a man who owed 10,000 talents was brought to him. Because he was not able to repay it, the Lord ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, children, and whatever he possessed, and repayment to be made. Then the slave threw himself to the ground before him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will repay everything. The Lord had compassion on that slave, and released him, and forgave him the debt. Yeah, so imagine this this 10,000 talents here. Um, for the purposes of our story, uh, let's let's say it's $10,000. It's not like, it would have represented uh, you know, more than that even, more than $10,000. But it's important because we're going to make a comparison here in a moment. Right. So this this slave owes this Lord again, when it says Lord here, it's not referring to God. It's referring to the king in this uh, hypothetical scenario in this parable. Uh, and so this Lord uh, forgives this debt of ten thousand dollars that this this slave could have never possibly repaid um, shows great mercy by forgiving a great debt. That's the important thing, a debt that was that would have not been repayable in any way. Um, the allegory here, right, is the debt that Christ will eventually pay for us, right? So that's the key thing to keep in mind. What this 10,000 talents is, the reason I said it's not really analogous to $10,000, this 10,000 talents for this slave would have never been able to be repaid. That would have been understood when Jesus was telling the story, okay? So now uh, starting in verse, uh, actually, okay, if anybody... If anybody would like to uh, help read, I'm out of volunteers. So give it just a second if anybody wants to. Okay, we've got Shanique here. Uh, Shanique, if you will read for us verses uh, 28 uh, to 30, please. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. After he went out, that same slave found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 <laughs> silver coins. So he grabbed him by the throat and started to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. Then his fellow slave threw himself down and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will repay you. But he refused. Instead, he went out, 
threw him in prison until he, he paid the debt. All right, thank you. So here's the comparison, right? We've got 10,000 talents, and we've got 100 silver coins, okay? So this man was forgiven an unpayable debt, 10,000 talents. The comparison here, you know, like I said, um, you know, we'll, we'll say it's $10,000 just to give us some sort of a reference. It's significantly more than that. The comparison here to 100 silver coins would be like a dollar, like a single dollar, right? right? Jesus is making a very clear distinction between a huge unpayable debt that was forgiven to this man versus like literally petty cash, right? Like, like nothing. This, this, like nobody, if, if you, if you lost this money from, from your, your bank account, you would probably never even notice that it was gone. That's the distinction that, that Jesus is making here. And this, this slave who was forgiven this great debt refused to forgive his peer of a negligible debt. All right. So what happens next? Uh, all right. Lady S, if you'll help us read again, uh, verses 31 to 33. Verse 31, when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were very upset and went and told their Lord everything that had taken place. Then his Lord called the first slave and said to him, evil slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have shown mercy to your fellow slave just as I showed it to you? to 35 thank you to whoever just messaged me that i was muted uh, i've been talking and y'all are probably real confused <laughs> okay uh yes lady s if you could help us uh, and finish us off here at the <laughs> verses 34 to 35 okay and in anger, his Lord turned him over to the prison guards to torture him until he repaid all he owed. Verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. I was muted again and I started talking. I got to remember to do that. <laughs> all right, so we've seen Jesus here uh echo this sentiment a few times already in Matthew, and I honestly don't remember if he does it again or not. Um, but when you, you hear um, this idea of, I know we've talked in the past, and, and you're probably familiar with the verse, well, the Bible says not to judge, right? Actually, what the Bible says is, just judge not, lest ye be judged, right? What that means is, by the same standard that you judge someone else, you will be judged, Right? And this is that same sentiment where we have, we see in Jesus's story, a king who is willing just because we ask of it, right? To forgive us our insurmountable, unpayable debt. But he expects something from us in return for that, which is very interesting, right? It's not something we talk about that. And what he expects is that we will have, we will show same grace for our brother that he shows for us but he expects that we will follow his example right we talked about this earlier will god give me anything that i ask for well when your will and his will are aligned yes right because as we become more and more like him and our wills become aligned that's what it's talking about here. As we become more and more like him, we are expected to have the same grace for others that he has for us. So that's why Jesus, this whole thing, again, is Jesus explaining why he said not seven times, but 70 times seven, right? Um, he's saying it's not an exact number of times. What he's saying is you were forgiven a debt that you could never possibly repay. And that we should we should extend that same love, that same grace 
to those who owe us a debt, right? And we also see Jesus give the same sentiment when he teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? God, forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors, right? And so we see that again and again, that there is this expectation from Christ, from God, that we be like him and that we extend grace in the same way that grace is extended to us. And so that's the challenge. This is the end of chapter 34, or <laughs> chapter 34, it's the end of chapter 18. But that's the challenge for, for each and every one of us, right? Um, it's really hard to forgive sometimes, right? Um, it's, I feel like, honestly, for me, sometimes it's harder for me to forgive the petty things. Uh, and so I don't think it's a must, you know, uh, uses such a petty example of this, right? Like, I think, let me give you an example, right? If I'm driving down the road and somebody hits my car and I get in a car accident, that person, like, damages my vehicle because of their negligence, right? Now we got to go through this whole big process and insurance and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, when I get out of that car, I'm scared. That person's scared. I'm probably thinking more like, are you okay? Like, hey, it's okay. We'll get this stuff sorted out. Like, I'm probably not going to be angry at them based on my experience. But I'll tell you, a person who just cuts me off and keeps on going, man, I'm stew on that for a long time. I don't, I don't know if any of you have that same experience, right? But in the grand scheme of things, that's such a smaller issue. That's such a tiny, petty thing. Like, no actual harm was done. But how often do we find ourselves in those little moments, those little slices of life, when someone cuts us off and our, and our reaction is, you know what? I'm going to forgive them like God forgave me, right? Like... Sometimes those petty ones for me, I think, are harder to forgive. That's what Jesus calls us to do, right? Because there is no debt that someone could owe to us greater than the debt that Christ paid off for us. So, all right, let's pray. God, we come before you right now. We thank you so much again for this time to come together. We, we thank you that the technology worked in spite of all of the challenges that we faced today. Um, as individuals and as a church, God. Um, and I just thank you. I thank you for your sacrifice for us. I thank you for your guidance. Um, I thank you for the challenge that you have issued us here at the end of Matthew chapter 18 to forgive those who have trespassed against us and who have wronged us, God. Uh, I ask that for each and every one of us that you give us those reminders and those slice of life moments to have that grace, to have that forgiveness for others, God, and that you also give us the strength to do what you have called us to do and to forgive those who have wronged us, God, whether it be petty or whether it be large. God, if any of us have grudge in our heart right now against someone else in your life, I pray that you would let this verse eat at us until we do what we need to do to make it right so that we can live out the example that you laid out for us. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for all you've done in and through VR and MMO Church and everything you're going to continue to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen.